you once again for coming along to Eco Views and News. This week we're going to be looking again a little bit at the <coughs> Fukushima Daiichi problem. And in fact, because it's gotten a lot worse since we last met. Uh, it's gotten worse not just in Japan, but for the global community as a whole. And we need to begin to take that into account. The citizen scientists around the world have got to start getting organized and listen to this problem because we're in a meltdown situation now that we hadn't anticipated. We thought it could be contained as it were, but we've been living in a kind of fantasy land and not just in reference to the incident that's just occurred, but more generally in reference to nuclear power. This incident in a sense should, should shake us up as a global community about this. It certainly has shaken Japan up and they're rethinking their entire nuclear strategy. There are signs that Germany is as well, that China is, and that India is. There are certainly popular demonstrations against nuclear power in all of these countries. We need to start looking at what, in fact, has happened in uh, Fukushima to see if we can get out of this um, fantasy land that we're in. Because, in effect, as the information we've been reviewing over several weeks has shown we may be in a state of aftershock, making the wrong decisions in the wake of this catastrophe. We reviewed this a while back on the previous programs with the part one and the, uh, part two, uh, drawing attention to the fact that a lot of nuclear plants are near coastal areas <coughs> using the ocean water as a coolant, and that's a problem. Because with sea level rise, let alone with uh, tsunamis, but just with sea level rise that's foreseeable in the next century, these areas are vulnerable to storm surge under more severe weather conditions, all of which are likely to happen. That is more severe weather, uh, increased severe weather with storm surge and vulnerability of existing plants, which contain the spent radiation on site. Because in the United States, we haven't yet developed a national storage plan. Furthermore, we're subject in the East Coast of the United States to the danger of tsunami. Now, we don't live on a border plate of the uh, famous movement of plate tectonics, uh, like the Pacific plate is moving in Japan, but that doesn't mean we're immune from tsunamis. On the contrary, the most powerful kind of tsunami can be generated from landslides off the edges of volcanoes that are unstable. And in fact, if they're right in the ocean, those volcanoes can destroy things thousands of miles away as sides of the mountains slip into the ocean, generating huge waves. And this is what has already been foreseen for the movement of a volcano in the Canaries, known as La Palma. So we reviewed that a bit, and we reviewed the fact that Fukushima has at this point been categorized as the same level severity, a nuclear level seven crisis uh, as Chernobyl. And we looked at what was similar and what was different in previous programs. And we want to look a little bit more at that because of what we aren't fully aware of in reference to Chernobyl. Chernobyl happened 25 years ago. In fact, the anniversary was just recently. But the full story of Chernobyl has not come out in the official circles. And in fact, the UN hasn't acted very well in this. Uh, some of the reports are now making it clear that the UN agency that's supposed to be guarding public health in these realms, the World Health Organization, hasn't been doing its job. And both the Fukushima incident and the Chernobyl incident 25 years ago make this clear. An international coalition of NGOs called Independent WHO, says the multilateral agency has never shown independence in its decision or actions in terms of living up to its mandate of protecting the victims of radioactive contamination. The coalition of NGOs states that the WHO is effectively subservient to the IAEA, that is the International Agency uh, sorry, International Atomic Energy Agency. And that subservience prevents the UN agency, WHO, 
from taking any initiative or action to achieve its objectives, the preservation and the improvement of health. So WHO hasn't come through with the information that's now starting to come out from who? Well, from Soviet scientists themselves, former Soviet scientists, Russian scientists, and Ukrainian scientists. Take a look. Welcome to Enviro Close-Up. I am Carl Grossman. With me is Dr. Vladimir Chenu Asenko. He was the physicist in charge of the cleanup at the Chernobyl nuclear plant accident. Dr. Chenu Asenko, the aftermath that we know of in terms of Chernobyl apparently was much more serious than we've been told. Yes, unfortunately, that's true. Дело в том, что, как я многократно говорил, эту проблему постаралась засекретить мое правительство. As I have said many times, the, my government tried to cover up the consequences. И она выдавала дозированную информацию, которая далека от истины. And gave out small doses of information that are actually far from the truth. Now, this is a very revealing piece. This was the physicist in charge of the cleanup coming out in 2007 and saying clearly his government was trying to cover up the information. Let's go back and try to pick it up a bit itself to see where he's saying this. Okay, Dr. Vladimir Chernosenko. He's coming out on the record in 2007 and saying flat out that it's much more serious. And gave out small doses of information that are actually far from the truth. What is the truth? For one thing, the truth is that it's the first truly international nuclear disaster in the world. Которая дала uh, нам понять, я имею в виду прежде всего ученым, физикам. Which gave us, I mean, uh, scientists, the opportunity to understand for the first time. Что uh, реальная опасность uh, в мире от работающих опасных производств типа ядерных блоков гораздо больше. Uh, gave us a chance to understand that for the first time they... Uh, truly colossal consequences and dangers of uh, the use of nuclear power. Uh, a disaster at a nuclear plant in one country is enough to destroy not only that country but the entire world. Okay, now this is pretty extraordinary uh, footage. It's now been uh, released. Carl Grossman has it on his program, and you can view it on YouTube. Yeah, In so fact, we'll, we'll be putting it up, the connection to it, on the web so that you can get uh, access to it. But this is back in 2007 that he did this. In addition, more recently, this past February, Earth Focus did a similar uh, study on the Chernobyl event, and basically they're saying there was a cover-up as well. Take a look. And it's pretty staggering. <laughs> Today on Earth Focus, Chernobyl, the real story. International agencies, the nuclear industry, and governments involved ignore important scientific data about the consequences of the nuclear disaster at Chernobyl. A screw-up or a cover-up? Authors of a new book say it was a massive cover-up and that the real story is far worse than you think. Coming up on Earth Focus. Okay, well, you get the idea. In fact, the book has been published, and you ought to take a look at it. If you get a chance, make sure you get a copy of this book. It's been put out by the New York Academy of Sciences, and um, why not ask the library to get several copies and start circulating it here in Cambridge, in one in each um, branch of the library at least. This is a, uh, a massive academic study, but not by American scientists. These are by Soviet, Ukrainian, and Belarus scientists in their own journals translated into English for the first time and published uh, just this last uh, March. In fact, it was published in February, um, but we're just getting access to it. It was published before the Fukushima event, but now we're beginning to realize its uh, true significance here. A massive collection of documents. Please do get a hold of a copy. 
um, it's going to be very important for citizen scientists to get, uh, get through on this issue. So take a look at it. It's um, subtitled, Consequences of the Catastrophe for People in the Environment. Uh, it was edited by Yablokov, Alexei Yablokov, and um, this is now available in English as part of the Annals of the New York Academy of Sciences. Okay, definitely get hold of it. Take a look at some of its, uh, its findings. It's pretty staggering. Earth Focus did a little bit of a study. 25 years ago, a mistake at the control switch caused the worst nuclear accident in history. Emissions from the reactor at Chernobyl in what is now Ukraine were a hundred times greater than the radioactive fallout from the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Fallout spread across the Northern Hemisphere as far as North America and China. Most heavily hit were areas closest to the disaster. Ukraine, Russia, and Belarus. A new book, Chernobyl, Consequences of the Catastrophe for People and the Environment, published by the New York Academy of Sciences, says that the impact on health is far worse than reported, and that Chernobyl is not over. Its toxic nightmare will go on for generations. This book surveyed well over 5,000 articles that have never been uh, translated in before into English. Mostly they were published in Belarus, Ukraine, and Russia. And what that data shows is that almost a million people died as a result of the radiation from Chernobyl. That number dwarfs the 4,000 that the World Health Organization and the International Atomic Energy Agency claim. Book authors say that the numbers are being lowballed because the International Atomic Energy Agency's mandate is to promote the nuclear industry. Well, they have an agreement as of 1959 that is still in effect that neither the World Health Organization nor the International Agency for Atomic uh, Energy will publish anything without the approval of the other. And that means that IAEA, with its strong nuclear industry bias, has veto power over the WHO. Authors say this agreement makes disclosure of the full impact of Chernobyl impossible. Professor Alexei Yablokov, the eminent Russian biologist and book co-author, calls for change. We say, let's this agreement. this agreement exists, we believe that the data that brings the Smyrna Organization is not allowed. And authors say that nuclear advocates not only minimize and trivialize fears about radioactivity, but do so by ignoring selected scientific data. They cite a 2005 report by the Chernobyl Forum as an example. The report, produced by a group of agencies led by the IAEA, said that outside of a spike in thyroid cancer cases in children, there is no demonstrated increase of cancers due to radiation in most affected populations. Вот этот Чернобыльский форум публикации и вызвал к жизни нашу публикацию. Когда мы увидели эти данные, мы просто пришли в ярость, потому что ну, Чернобыльские вот заявления этих Чернобыльского форума, как это может быть? Это, это идет против научных фактов, это идет против жизни. Работ на самом деле Чернобыльских опубликовано очень много. Мои, по моим подсчетам, около 30 тысяч научных работ. Чернобыльский форум, о котором я говорил, основывается, например, на 300-400 на работах, опубликованных только в, на, на, в, в англоязычных журналах. А, он игнорирует вот те работы, которые были опубликованы в России, вроде бы под тем предлогом, что они не соответствуют научным протоколам. Как и, ну, ну, в общем, всякие уловки, чтобы не, уч не учитывать эти работы. The Chernobyl Forum report also said the illness associated with radiation may actually only be psychological or stress-related, something called radiophobia, a fact which book authors vehemently contest. Официальная точка зрения, что они признают, что на территориях, которые поражены чернобыльскими, состояние здоровья очень плохое. Но они говорят, это потому плохое здоровье, что люди боятся радиации, что у них радиофобия, что они там ведут неправильный образ жизни, что они очень бедные и так далее. А мы на это отвечаем. А какая может быть радиофобия у лягушек, у крыс, у, у птиц, 
рыб, которых мы изучаем там, и которых то же самое поломаны хромосомы, также нарушен иммунитет, все примерно те же самые изменения здоровья, плохие изменения здоровья наблюдаются, которые мы видим у людей. Какая там может быть радиофобия? Well, I think you get the point. The uh, official reports, as sanctioned by the IAEA, basically blame the victims. And the question is, in effect, what's next? This kind of official cover-up and smokescreen on the part of the IAEA censoring the WHO ability even to go in and investigate this leads to the question, okay, in this case, Fukushima, what can we expect next? Well, unfortunately, things took a, uh, a turn for the worse in events on the 12th of May. And this last week, there was a setback at the nuclear plant, and it's a pretty dramatic setback. Sea samples taken in the area contained the concentrations of cesium-134 at 18,000 times the permitted level. More than 80,000 local residents living within the 20-mile, or 20-kilometer, 12-mile radius of the plant have been evacuated forever from their homes. Agriculture and businesses have been hit, and there is no time scale yet for allowing residents to return. Total compensation claims are not yet known, but analysts say they might be more than 100 billion yen, 61 billion or somewhere, 100 billion dollars, 61 billion pounds. Well, this came out in the form of a headline from uh, some news agencies that it's official. There was a nuclear meltdown and the crippled Daiichi plant in Japan, which will likely affect the area for the next couple of thousand years. This is stag staggering. It just hasn't sunk in in America at all. Nuclear alert, it's official. There was a nuclear meltdown at the crippled Daiichi plant in Japan. Now let's take a look at that news program because they, just listening to the delivery of the, of the information hammers home the seriousness of it here. The severity has to do with how long this is going to be enduring. This isn't going to be cleaned up quickly. The news is official. There was a nuclear meltdown at the crippled Daiichi plant in Japan. TEPCO workers stepped inside reactor number one for the first time last week discovered that some of the nuclear fuel rods had been exposed to air and melted down, burning a hole in the containment vessel and leaking tons of radioactive wastewater into the ocean. That means it's back to the drawing board for plant workers who were hoping to perform a cold shutdown of the plant in the next few days. Now that task to, is to contain the meltdown, which will likely affect the area for the next couple hundred thousand years. The Republican-controlled house... Next couple hundred thousand years. It's staggering. In the best of the rest of the news, it's official. There was a nuclear meltdown at the crippled Daiichi plant in Japan. TEPCO workers stepped inside reactor number one for the first time last week and discovered that some of the nuclear fuel rods had been exposed to air and melted down, burning a hole in the containment vessel and leaking tons of radioactive wastewater into the ocean. That means it's back to the drawing board for plant workers who were hoping to perform a cold shutdown of the plant in the next few days. Now that task to, is to contain the meltdown, which will likely affect the area for the next couple hundred thousand years. Not the next couple hundred years, not the next couple thousand years, but the next couple hundred thousand years. This is pretty staggering, very staggering. No one's really absorbed it yet. How could this happen? How could we have been so blind to the inherent dangers of nuclear energy? How could both our leaders and the public have been so wrong for so long on nuclear power? In fact, we can see that there is a partial answer to this question because we've all been duped in a way. Take a look at what's happened. During the 1950s, a well-financed and popularly projected fantasy science began to invade people's homes through the commercially driven new technology of television, Disneyland. Disneyland brought all of this to us. A whole generation of Americans, a generation of children who went to school in the 50s and 60s, and who are now our leaders, was subjected to a sustained fantasy world of Tinkerbell science. It's little wonder that as leaders of today's institutions, they continue to live in a fantasy land. What, you might ask, does Tinkerbell have to do with atomic energy? 
Well, as it turns out, she has a lot to do with it. Both uh, she and it, that is, nuclear energy, were promoted by Walt Disney uh, to a gullible American public who were just watching TV for the first time. Take a look. It's really quite staggering. Those who sought to profit from the civilian application of military technology in the post-World War II decades strongly supported a well-orchestrated campaign to convince who? Convince America's children that nuclear energy was their friend. It was called Our Friend the Atom, and Walt Disney promoted it. He came into America's homes once a week with this powerful message aimed at children, and it was very effective, basically indoctrinating a whole generation uh, that nuclear energy was both available and cheap and our friend. <laughs> As you enter this timeless land, one of these many worlds will open to you. Frontierland. Tall tales and true from the legendary past. Tomorrowland. Promise of things to come. Adventureland. The wonder world of nature's own realm. Fantasyland, the happiest kingdom of them all. Presenting this week... Many years ago, a prophetic writer and engineer told of the genius of one man who discovered the very power of the universe and harnessed it to propel his ship 20,000 leagues under the sea. But the hero of that story was afraid to let this power fall into the hands of an immature mankind. And so he chose rather to destroy his own work. often has a way of becoming fact. Not long ago, we brought you the immortal tale, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, featuring the famous submarine Nautilus. According to the story, this craft was powered by a magic force. Today, that tale has come true. This is a model of the real Nautilus, the world's first atom-powered ship. It's the first example of the useful power of the atom that will drive the machines of our atomic age. The atom is our future. It is a subject everyone wants to understand. So we felt it was the most important topic for a Tomorrowland program. In fact, we considered it so important that we embarked on several atomic projects. For one, we made plans to build an exhibit at Disneyland that will show you atomic energy in action. Now our atomic projects here at the studio are twofold. We prepared this program and also a book so that we could tell you this important story in full detail. Okay, in full detail. This is Walt Disney saying, and it's one of the first, in fact, I think it is the first combined program and book that you can write for and get, uh, get fully indoctrinated here. Basically, this is the problem. We've been living in a fantasy land when it comes to uh, 
to these kinds of things and um, been driven, our leaders have been driven into thinking that through Disney cartoons and the like and fantasy lands that they are in fact safe. They in fact aren't safe and we're beginning to see this in the meltdown in fantasy land. Okay, keep in touch. We're going to keep in abroad and in touch with these issues around the world. Thank you very much.